Yeah, there's just a lot of uh, negativity, and 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 I think uh, at the end of the day, um, people don't want to feel that way about their work, about their passion, about the thing that they uh, put all their time and effort into. Uh, that that being technology, and uh, yeah, to me, I see EAC as a as a response to to that to to the that 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 uh, the last you know ten or fifteen years of of of, of culture, uh, especially that made people feel like persecuted for, for, for doing this sort of thing uh, and for, for being engaged in, in, in building technology. And, and at the end of the day, uh, if you want to do hard things, if you want to uh, try to uh, engineer systems that uh, no one thinks are possible to engineer, uh, if you want to do research that nobody thinks is uh, you know, possible to resolve, uh, you have to have a, an unwavering uh, like belief in, in yourself and your ability to do that. This week on Moment of Zen, I sit down with Nadia Asperuva and Bayslord to explore the roots and significance of effective accelerationism. Bayslord is a founder of EAC, and Nadia has a new article out discussing the movement. They both deliver great insight, so please enjoy. Hey everyone, I'm here today with two returning Moment of Zen guests, Bayslord and Nadia. Guys, welcome back. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Yeah, good to be uh, here. So you you two have come, just come out with a post. Uh, on on EAC, among other things. And first, we were just talking off, off camera base, so I, I want to uh, bring back that discussion of how do you feel about the perception of, of EAC? You know, people ask, is it is it a meme? Is it a philosophy? People have all sorts of interpretations of, of what EAC is and what it stands for and what its contribution is. W where do you resonate with sort of that perception and where do you think it misses the misses the mark of what you're really trying to do? Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's a whole range of opinions about this. Uh, yeah, I think that, uh, a, a, a large number of people do understand that, uh, like, like, I think like the, the, the basic, uh, thing that we're trying to do here, which is point out flaws in, in the ways that, uh, you know, other enterprises are, are, uh, doing things, uh, and, um, trying to sort of take, yeah, yeah the, the kinds of actions that they take in the world. And, uh, I think also just this 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 very core uh kind of like psychological element which i think is 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 poorly understood right so uh i get the, this this uh you know yak is not uh a movement it's not a philosophy it's just it's just like a meme i think i get that all the time i think a lot of people have made this criticism it's just like i don't know i see like 10 of these a day i actually don't know that it's wholly wrong but i think it doesn't really capture uh what has actually happened like it, it's 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 a it's not a uh an inaccurate kind of compression of the the whole phenomenon but uh it is missing something about um what's actually happened so it, yeah going back to like last year early last year or, or 21 right i think it's really hard to understate how pessimistic people were and how okay it was to be pessimistic and how this sort of thing of uh being like, okay, maybe we can kind of engineer, engineer a better world. And you know, there, there were threads of this and people had started to, 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 to pull on this, but I really think that, uh, especially like within an AI and, uh, with, within, um, you know, the, you know, in this kind of interaction space between, uh, people in like corporate tech and, uh, you know, uh, their companies and, and I guess the culture more uh, writ largely, uh, you know, journalists and, and so on. Um, I think, yeah, there's just a lot of uh, negativity, and 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 I think uh, at the end of the day, um, people don't want to feel that way about their work, about their passion, about the thing that they uh, put all their time and effort into. Uh, that that being technology, and uh, yeah, to me, I see EAC as a as a response to to that, to to the that 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 uh, the last you know ten or fifteen years of of of, of culture, uh, especially that made people feel like persecuted for, for, for doing this sort of thing uh, and for, for being engaged in, in, in building technology. And, and at the end of the day, uh, if you want to, if you want to do hard things, if you want to uh, try to uh, engineer systems that uh, no one thinks are possible to engineer, uh, if you want to do research that nobody thinks is uh, you know, possible to resolve, uh, you have to have a, an unwavering uh, like belief in, in yourself and your ability to do that. And, 
it helps when there's like a culture behind that. And I just think that, yeah, um, probably in previous eras, there were cultures that, that had captured that, uh, that essence and, uh, that, that spirit. And I think, uh, Yak is like about re recapturing that. I, I think that there are also some other, you know, like more, more technical aspects, more specific critiques of things, specific claims about how the world works and we could get into those. Um, but when people say like, it's just a vibe, I think it misses like what that does to culture. And I, and I think, yeah, maybe I'll just stop there since I was a bit long and rambling. Nadia, what, what's your reaction to that response to the same question or share your story a little bit with what, um, what captivated you or intrigued you about EAC in the first place in terms of wanting to, to write this piece and how is, how have your, as you've gotten to know Bayes, how has your kind of thinking evolved on it? Yeah, I think it is this, um, I don't know if you want to call it misperception or just widespread perception that it's just a vibe or just a meme that got me sort of curious to dig deeper because I think when people say it's just a meme, um, like what are they what are they trying to imply about it, right? Because like memes can still be impactful or they can still um, spark a lot of these new conversations. And um, it feels like when people are saying that they're trying to say it's not that impactful or it doesn't really mean a whole lot or it's, you know, we should just ignore it or dismiss it. Um, and I think especially, yeah, when I first started digging in around maybe like late this summer or so, um, there was a lot of just question of like, what is it even, or like, what does it stand for? Is there anything deeper there? There's just this like question of, is this even a valid thing for me to be thinking about at all? But a lot of people were talking about it. So um, that structurally just looked like a really interesting question for me to try to understand better. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, I share a lot of, of what they said around okay, like, even if there isn't, uh, yeah, I think like calling it a philosophy is a stretch. <laughs> um, but if it's not a philosophy, does that make it any less interesting or important or impactful? Um, I think it's still, it's a stand in for something that is shifting in tech culture right now. And, um, and I think that part gets missed a lot because EAC is, usually pulled into these, you know, debates about AI and where people want to talk about the underlying physics or, you know, all these try, I think they're trying to make it, um, they're trying like as, as though if you make it a philosophy, then it's legitimized or something versus like trying to understand it on its own terms. Um, and yeah, I think, I mean, I was <laughs> saying this to, to base before, I don't, this is a, a rough take a rough spicy take, but that's what this podcast is for. Right. Um, but like it, it, it has made me think about sort of like hipsters in the 2010s um, and how for like an entire decade, we had this notion, like cultural notion of a hipster um, and people were, there was like a lot of like surprising anger <laughs> directed towards it because no one could define what it is. You kind of know it when you see it. Um, and it was like, but it was like taking over culture, right? And I think it was just sort of funny to see how it like really upset people and they'd be like, this isn't even really a thing. Um, it's just these people that are acting like too cool for, you know. Um, but, you know, at, at this point, hipsters, the concept of hipsters sort of died out, but it, it died out because it became universally pervasive throughout like all of culture, right? It set the the bar for, you know, early Instagram culture. Um, it gave it, it raised the bar for everyone to have this sort of like baseline level of taste that didn't exist before. Um, and so it had this huge cultural impact, but it had it without being a clearly defined movement or philosophy or like, I still could not define a hipster for you. Um, and so I don't know what that category of thing is. Yeah. It's not a movement. It's not a philosophy. It's not a, it's not a meme. It's something else. Um, but I just, yeah. So maybe I'll interject there. Just, I actually yeah. think it's a different, kind of manifestation, right? It's like, even though there's like a, it's, it's, it's not so right. Uh, you know, what is a philosophy? It's like some, some person wrote a thing down and said, here's point a of this philosophy, here's point B and so on. Like that is, that is a, a way to do philosophy, right? You have like some explicit thing that comes out of that. Um, and you can kind of clearly reference a text and, uh, you know, things that people have said and you say, okay, well, you, you know, 
okay, I see how that matches to the text and you know, you're in line with the philosophy and here's the consistency. It's very explicit. I actually kind of think this is, I mean, in human history, this is probably a relatively new thing. Um, right. I, I like, uh, it's not always that culture has spread this way, uh, through, through writing. And I think this, this thing about formalizing stuff in terms of text, uh, it creates unnecessary rigidity in my opinion. And the, the, right, the truth, the truth about, you know, uh, myself, about Beth, about a lot of the people that, uh, were involved early on is like, what we realized is that we all shared a lot of like latent, uh, representations about how things, uh, kind of are and how they work and that, yeah, they kind of did differ from what the received, uh, wisdom was, uh, you know, whether it's like the EA stuff or, uh, more strictly kind of like AI doom, uh, uh, uh camp, um, uh, or whatever else. I think we just realized that, uh, no, we shared a lot of, uh, beliefs that, that were just not, yeah, for various reasons, we're not like being synchronized, like the, no, the, the sort of mutual knowledge about them is like not being synchronized well. And so I almost think the yeah, act in a way is like this kind of like latent space synchronization, uh, kind of happening over the last uh, year and a half, whereas like everybody has like mutual knowledge and sort of like knowledge that everyone that has the knowledge and so on. And, um, and so in this sense, like, I would say what did, I mean, we can play like the, the semantics game about this, but I think like, uh, you know, functionally speaking, right. Like what did it, what has it done? Um, yeah, I think people, people being uh, like people having the knowledge that other people agree with them and will support them and, uh, are for what they're doing. And, uh, that, 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 you know, uh, technology is a force for good, like things that a lot of people just think are kind of plainly true. Um, yeah, no, no, that, that, that there's like coherence around all of this. And I, I think this is, this is, um, I mean, what, yeah, what is, what is a movement? What is a philosophy? I think, uh, this is what it looks like in, in function. And so I don't know the underlying way that it's implemented. I think I'm just, uh, I don't know. I don't care. It's, it's funny because yeah, we, you know, it started by Beth and I, I mean, it's basically an oral tradition more than it is anything, right? So, right, it's, and, and, and there, there's, of course, there's tweets and posts, but um, a lot of this happened in spaces that weren't recorded, that uh, hundreds or thousands of people listened to uh, or very early on. Uh, and, and, and over time, it just kind of built up from there. And, and I think like a lot of the reactions are like demands for conformity to a thing, to, to a way of doing things that, um, I don't think it's like necessary for this. I felt like we needed a word for like, I feel like we needed a word for the default tech position pre backlash, which like, I don't think we had to make these things that explicit in, you know, the heyday of startups in the early 2010s or whatever. Um, and then like, to me, being able to understand the impact or the importance or, you know, why do we even need EAC if it's so vague and so undefined or whatever, um, is by looking at tech's recent history. And, um, yeah, like, I think it used to just be that you could accept that tech is good and <laughs> within tech, right. You know, that wasn't a, a position you had to defend. And then there was a sort of like seeping in of, a. uh, whatever these more like pessimistic views after after the backlash that um i think for until recently were kind of directed towards the outside world so you had this sort of like culture war clash between like tech versus media or whatever um that dominated you know it, it's, it's a like covid pandemic kind of times and then it's only in the recent year or two i think because of the explosion of ai that um now you see this sort of like infighting that is happening within tech and people realizing, oh, it's not actually just like, it used to be an us versus them of, oh, I thought tech was united on this front and all those other people out there had a different set of views. And people are now realizing, oh, within tech, people are now having this, there's like a, its own divide or civil war or something. And so you had, you know, you could, you could put a name onto the, the more pessimistic view, but there just wasn't a name for the other view. And I think that is the primary function that yeah, we actually didn't. I don't know that we really had a name for the as, for the, the total pessimistic view. I kind of think we named both, um, and maybe that's just yeah, part of the thing. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think you're right. Because it, it does encompass also like a bunch of other different subcultures, even within what's, that sort of maybe more pessimistic. What's or... your, uh, sorry, what's what's your memory on this? Because like to my, my memory, I'm like, did people really call like the, the Doomer meme was kind of like not so well formed around like tech itself and especially around like AI, like it, it had been said, but it wasn't really like a, a thing that people were saying. It applies to other stuff like outside of tech, but yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it. like the prepper kind of thread of this or something. And even like, you know, climate doomers or just people that right. were. Yeah. It, again, I think yeah. like during the backlash, it felt like an external a view that didn't belong inside tech, where it was like, oh, a lot of people are scared about the future, but like not us in here. And then suddenly people realizing, oh, even among my peers, there are people now who are work in tech and are, you know, not that excited about the future. And that's weird and new. Even when we use the term doomer or decel, it feels like it's ascribed towards people in tech. Like, do we call Kara Swisher a doomer or, or Casey Nice or uh, Newton or um, out of these people or who, who've been critiquing tech for a long time? Uh, I don't have a strong opinion about that because I don't. I don't want to have. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I just. I, I think, it, and this is sort of my my own sort of wrestling with it a bit, like. It is a really reductive debate that we're having right now, right? Or, or there's a very reductive sort of culture war that is happening within tech that is sort of very roughly split into like X cells and D cells or whatever you want to call it. And um, and I I, I kind of hate that it's so simple, but I also think it's really necessary. Even if I personally like, I'm not going to sit here being like, oh, this person's a D cell or not or whatever. Um, the meta of it of like, why are we having this conversation? And it feels really important uh, because it is to me sort of this battle for the future of tech. Like it is the the job of people in tech is not to be afraid of the future. That's for other parts of society to worry about. Um, so I do think the, the conversation is important, but, um, but yeah. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Real quick, what's the easiest choice you can make? Taking the window instead of the middle seat. Outsourcing business tasks that you absolutely hate. What about selling with Shopify? <laughs> Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Whether you're selling security systems or marketing memory modules, Shopify helps you sell everywhere, from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. I've used it in the past at the companies I've founded, and when we launch merch here at Turpentine, Shopify will be our go-to. Shopify helps turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. And Shopify helps you sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. With Shopify Magic, whip up captivating content that converts from blog posts to product descriptions. Generate instant FAQ answers. Pick the perfect email send time. Plus, Shopify Magic is free for every Shopify seller. Businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash moment of zen. Go to shopify.com slash moment of zen now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash moment of zen. Let's push this out a bit more because this is one of the main parts in your piece that I find so interesting. Um, you know, now do you use sort of Teal's, uh, you know, definite optimism, definite pessimism, indefinite optimism, definite pessimism framework to kind of contextualize sort of, um, you know, tech culture over the past few, few decades. So why don't, why don't you work through the the framework that you use um, and how you situate EAC as sort of a, a response to it or, or where it fits in within that sort of uh, genealogy, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I think like, we both sort of flushed that out together in talking about it. But um, but yeah, we've in, in like our conversations, at least, I think we've talked about how... Um, like, I think this is not said explicitly enough, but I think a lot of people looked at tech in the 2010s and the sort of, you know, buzzy, colorful, flashy SaaS startup era as um, it was lucrative for a lot of people and it sort of helped put tech on the map in a way that it wasn't before, but it did embody this indefinite optimism that TL talks about in Zero to One. 
Um, and he actually specifically calls out that era. Like Zero to One was published in 2014. It was like during this time. And even at that time, Teal was sort of saying, hey, it's like, you know, this, um, it's like indefinite optimism being this feeling of being excited about the future, but not really knowing why the future is exciting or how to get there. And so instead of having these like concrete plans and visions for how the future should be different and being able to articulate this and an independent opinion about what you think the world should look like and then how you're going to get there. Um, that's what a definite optimist would do. And an indefinite optimist just kind of says, I don't know if I keep, you know, building SaaS startups or I keep, or I, you know, going to management consulting after college or whatever, things will just kind of work themselves out. And I'm just not going to think that much about it. And um, I think that's sort of what happened in the 2010s because things were just so, it was so easy to, build a startup that was kind of trivial and um, everyone was just sort of like bringing the offline world online with this, you know, just adding a software layer to everything. So it's, it's very like tempting and understanding like, you know, why that era was the way it was, but I don't know that yet yeah, people in the forefront of tech right now feel necessarily proud of that. Era. I always think of it as sort of tech's, you know, Disney star era or something like early Miley Cyrus, Hannah Montana or something. Whereas like, you know, you're, you're, you're the adolescent, you're sort of, you know, you're doing the thing that's easy, you're trying things out. So I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but I don't think that really defines tech moving forward. And I think it's sort of this unspoken thing or, or some, something that doesn't get caught enough is the people that are critical of tech are criticizing that period. And I don't think a lot of them even understand what is happening in tech right now, because like all they really know is this like frozen in time adolescent version of tech. Um, and so they call it, you know, frivolous, obsessed with money, whatever. And it's like, yeah, that was kind of a different era. Um, and I think a lot of people today also, like even people who are like within tech or people who are EX or whatever, like they also look at that time. They're kind of like, yeah, I'm not super proud of that, that era. Um, when I was trying to just like understand EAC and then trying to like get into the heads of <laughs> um, Bayes and Beth and stuff, I just kind of like went through like all their tweets. Um, and I felt like that was a motif that... I noticed that wasn't getting talked about enough. Like everyone was talking about the AI part and everyone was talking about the accelerating part. And, but, you know, there's both, I think, Bayes and Beth have like talked, had a bunch of critiques of, you know, the big tech era or being this sort of at an overfunded startup or being like overly comfortable um, in these tech jobs that pay a lot of money, but like aren't actually that impactful. And I feel like that's a, a thread that is maybe uh, getting lost in the conversation. And I think that's what people are reacting to now. I would say that tech today is like much closer to the definite optimist version than the indefinite version from like a decade ago. What you, you mentioned sort of tech started more, more definite optimist and then became more indefinite optimist. Can you see more of what was the de original kind of definite or either of you de definite optimist vision you say in your piece, we went from, you know, build a world that looks like X to a world, you know, build X for Y. Can you say more about what the, initial um vision was or or how that changed i think the like the pre before the indefinite version of the 2010s there was like the more definite you know early internet computing pioneers and face do you want to talk about that a little bit or... yeah the kind of like narrative arc that we like hit on here that we're trying to explore in the pieces like um yeah i mean i i, I haven't <clears throat> thought about this like uh really concretely for you know like further back in history, but certainly like the early uh, visions of the internet were like really utopian in concrete ways, like connect everybody, index the world's knowledge, like, you know, put, make culture, you know, digital so that, uh, you know, like the speed of it is faster and, and, and like all of this stuff, which is really specific, like you can write down how you would make the world that way. And um, I think like they went and actually built it. Like the mad lads did it, you know, like they actually went and did it. And, and, and then, uh, you know, continuing the, 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 the thread here, it's like, well, okay. Uh, how do we like, you know, came to, how do we like pay for this? How do we kind of sustain this? What happens when this becomes not just the, uh, invention part, uh, you know, but the, the maintenance part. And, and I think like, it just had a lot of ramifications for culture over time that were like, really, really negative. And I think, you know, in a way, right, this is like really aligned with like Teal's, Teal's observations that everybody's familiar with. 
I think it's really interesting to ask the question, like why it took um, like 10 years for it, people, for the thing to cash out. Like, why are we only just now seeing um, this, this resurgence of like, no, we can fucking build whatever we want to build. Uh, like we can, we can make the world really good. Uh, you know, you, oh, you, there, you think there's like a problem with the technology that we're going to build. We can engineer uh, the system better. We can, we can do it better. Um, and what, like why, and, and, you know, uh, the, the specifically, right. is like, um, people saying, okay, well, I want to build an AI system that is capable of, uh, you know, discovering drugs at a superhuman level or, you know, playing games at a superhuman level, or, or, you know, you can go down the list, right. Uh, in, in, you know, doing therapy with people at a superhuman level, like the, the applications of, of intelligence obviously are so broad. So, uh, or, or, or like fusion energy or something, right. Why is it that it took 10 years to, to kind of, uh, see the like momentum build up around definiteness. Um, I think there's like a couple of interesting reasons. We talk about some of them, um, uh, in, in the piece, right. But, um, yeah, like I, I actually think before the, the, the kind of, you know, like being like a, a, a utopian about, um, like Uber or like, I don't know. You know, it's like, it's a really cool function and certainly like smartphones enabled a lot of stuff. That's really interesting, but it's like, um, kind of like in the subgraph of like connecting people and kind of making information and culture move faster. Right. Like before you, you know, you would call somebody on a pay phone and be like, Hey, can you come to, uh, let me look at the street corner. I don't know, you know how people did it. I, I actually have no clue how people got rides before, but like something like that maybe. And, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, the taxi shows up like two hours later and you're like, all right, finally I can get to where I'm going. It costs $700 and whatever. Um, yeah, so so cool. But like the utopian, so, so the idea like, okay, I'm going to do an, a business like this. I'm going to do, you know, uh, you know, Uber for Y. And, and, and um, like uh, then once, once I exit, once I have some liquidity, then I can, you know, put, put money into these more exotic projects. I'll... Um, and, 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 you know, you have people who made like really earnest efforts in this. Like, I think Brian Johnson is like a really good example of this, where he actually went and, 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 and he did that. He made a very like trad business. He exited, he dumped a huge fraction of his money into crazy, uh, ideas like kernel, uh, which are incredible. And, uh, you know, I'm very hopeful that it will cash out. And now, yeah, he's, he's, he's spun it, spun it into this thing about, uh, like, you know, what if, uh, I just build longevity from myself out, you know, like. Uh, I think this is, this is the kind of thing that people, uh, like dreamt of doing, but in a way, right. It's like, um, the reason there was a time lag is because it was actually really just not so easy. And now like, um, we're moving into a world where we have a lot more capacity to build technology. Like AI actually is, you know, increases people's leverage a lot. Um, uh, having had all of this, you know, uh, build up of like information infrastructure creates, uh, you know, the conditions under which we can do things like, uh, you know, look at, look at a lot of data and then like try to integrate it and, and, and all these things that people kind of talked about doing, but never really cashed out. And, uh, I also think there's another interesting piece here and, and maybe I'll stop after this. Uh, cause I think, yeah, we could just keep going on this line, but, um, yeah, you know, in 2014, in 2010, 20, 2011, 20, you know, 2014, 2015, the people who, um, yeah. So, so, you know, this, uh, the story about, uh, the, the four minute mile, um, you know, it, I think it took until like, you know, the fifties or something before there was like a recorded, I think it was the fifties, right. Uh, before there was like a recorded four minute mile, a sub four minute mile. And, uh, you know, now I think there's like something like 1700, uh, or 1800, uh, sub four minute miles on record. I think like this, this thing about productivity gains in cultural, uh, like, yeah, in, in, in culture around like the belief and like boldness that is required to do things that are really hard is, uh, an important variable here. And I think it's really interesting to note that the people who were born in like 2000, uh, you know, uh, right. Are, are, are just kind of moving into the age where they can really be impactful in this space. Right. They're like, uh, maybe they're finishing university or they're at the age where they've dropped out and had a couple of years of experience like building. And, and now, you know, and it's like at that, at the, so these people grew up watching, you know, Elon 
just absolutely succeed at, at all these really, really impossibly difficult things and seeing other people do, do similar things. Right. And I think like, uh, I mean, it's hard to, to understate Elon's impact here in my opinion, but, uh, because yeah, I mean, in some sense, I really do think of him as like the guy who ran, you know, this first sub four minute mile and in, in, in terms of building all these things that are just so impossibly hard, you know, you, you ask, why is there stagnation for the last 50 years? You know, everybody's, Everybody's got an answer for this. Maybe it was the, there are too many lawyers. We started adding too many lawyers to the pool. Uh, there's too many regulations. Uh, you know, things got expensive. People talk about, you know, whatever, the gold standard. People, people have all kinds of explanations. We picked all the low hanging fruit in science, blah, 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 blah. Okay. You have to explain Elon though. Why is there an Elon? Why was Elon able to do it? Why, why, why were you not? I asked this question, you know, I, I, I posted about this. This is like, why are you not as productive as Elon? And people are like, I'm not as smart. I'm more lazy. I'm like, I sleep too much. I'm like anxious all the time. You know, people have all kinds of honest answers to this. I was like really surprised how honest people were and how much it, it evoked a response. But I think like, it's very hard to ignore the fact that one of the huge bottlenecks is just simply that, that thing of like determination times intelligence. And, uh, it's, it's not just about the context. And so now we're moving into a world where it's like the context, the, the, potential energy in technology is like increasing rapidly again. What does it mean when you have like on tap intelligence? It means that you can go and put intelligence anywhere it's needed and it's needed everywhere. It's needed all the time uh, for, you know, uh, we want it to be as cheap as, as, as it can be and so on. And so um, there's just so much dissipation of this, this new stuff. And I think like, yeah, you, you'll see the same in, in, in material science and uh, manufacturing and, and, and it's, so many people uh, really understand these gaps here and they've seen, they've seen what can be done. And I think people actually believe and they want to believe. And, and so to have a culture that embodies that spirit uh, is really critical. Actually, you know, I'll, I'll, okay. Last thing, one of the very early uh, memes that, that technically predates EAG, um, but, but only by a few weeks uh, was actually, um, you know, on this line of the, you know, the indefinite, the indefinite optimist kind of EA person who's like, oh, I'll just put money into the cause. And, you know, I'll just hopefully it'll work out. And, oh, you know, I'll try to do it better. And like, I won't give it to those bloated charities. I'll, I'll do it here uh, versus, you know, the definite optimist, which I, I think I, I specifically put Elon's head on on the on the Chad, you know, guy <laughs> on the right side. And, you know, it's like, you know, the only thing that could stop me is the law of, laws of physics, maybe. Right. I think like this. I don't know. I just like want to see more of this. I just want to see that more. And I think like everybody who's like put Yak in their tag, you know, or in their, in their display name, uh, and and uh, believes this too, and 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 sees that it's like actually possible. And and so like, uh, yeah, to me, it just feels like a dam has broken. And it yeah, it took like ten years to 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 cash out, uh, like what Teal said. But I think it's like very clearly happening. Uh, and I think there's always you know S curves. Like at some point, it'll saturate, but. Uh, if the rate of invention of new S curves uh, is is rapid enough, then it, it, that also won't matter. So, uh, okay, I'll stop there. I think this is again where like this used to just be the default view in tech. And um, I remember last year when I, I wrote this piece about like idea machines and, um, you know, are we going to start seeing a proliferation of new social movements in tech? Um, it kind of led with this question of like, why aren't there more effective altruisms? And if you kind of put yourself in the shoes of like pre, I mean, yeah, it's pre EAC, but it's also pre maybe a lot of the other sort of subcultures that we're seeing spring up around tech right now. Um, if you were, I think like within tech, because it is so practically oriented and so like, you know, action oriented, there's often, it, it, it felt like for a while, there just wasn't a need to sort of articulate these like deeper philosophies or, you know, defending why should you be here? Or like, why is your role important in society? Um, and the only place we really had any sort of outlet for, you know, deeper philosophies or conversations around that was effective altruism. Um, and for a long time, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's been much more maligned in the last, whatever year or two now, but, you know, for a while it was, it was kind of the, um, safe haven or whatever, the escape pad for people that wanted to have these conversations about, um, yeah, like how, how could you do things that weren't just straight up, you know, 
building startups or finding maybe like a, a deeper moral ground for like why technology is important or or whatever. Um, and then I think like in the last year or two, people just if you don't if you don't side with if if you need something more than effective altruism or you, you want to have just like you know a different point of view on it there like it used to just kind of be like there's a default view and then there's sort of like effective altruism for people that kind of want to do this weird sub niche thing um but i think because tech is the, the the moral validity of tech has been called into question more in recent years than it has before um yeah you just needed like a term for this and you need a you need an umbrella for people to, and, a, and a label for people to be able to say like i'm not that i'm this let's pour one out for effective altruism uh while we're, while we're, while we're... <laughs> i mean look like I'll, I'll say it on 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 record again i think like the ideals of ea are really uh you know kind of like good like the the founding sort of principles in my view uh are are, are great like what if we didn't waste a bunch of money on charities that are bloated and don't work? And instead we gave that money uh, to, to things that work way better uh, that are also charities. Um, cool. I think that's great. Whether or not they accomplished those things uh, well is actually quite a subtle question, I think. Um, and I think the uh, co-opting of the movement for uh, the purposes of talking about basically one thing only, which is uh, the kind of, risk risks associated with uh you know developing ai uh it's probably misguided wrong and uh, in general has been really bad for that movement but also probably bad for culture I, I don't know it's uh anyway uh yeah pour one out hey we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors if you're a startup founder or executive running a growing business you know that as you scale your systems break down and the cracks start to show if this resonates with you, there are three numbers you need to know. 36,000, 25, and one. 36,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamline accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind, so you get a customized solution for all your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist, designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, at netsuite.com slash zen. That's netsuite.com slash zen to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash zen. Um, cause it seems to have definitely, uh, died, <laughs> um, SBF wounded well, it. We'll see, and... we'll, see if, we'll see if they can find another thing to, 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 to shoot themselves in the foot with next November, uh, since they're right. It's a Bloody November. Annual, annual tradition of destroying themselves oh. a little bit more, right? SBF was last November. We yeah. have, uh, <laughs> the attempted, uh, destruction of open AI this November. The next Sam. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. It, it'll be election time too. It is interesting how EA just found itself sort of like uh, associated with the Democratic Party, and it, maybe that was just SBF, or maybe it was Dustin. I, I don't know, but just sort of like to the point where there were very few differences between a effective altruist and kind of a normie lib, basically, or at least that was the perception. Now, do you think it's unfair? Yeah. Well, I don't, yeah, I don't know that it's that simple, but I do wonder within this sort of you know bizarro world context of like the tech universe specifically um i do kind of wonder like okay now that we have ea and eac um again not to make everything so overly black and white but like right now it feels like there's these like two camps um that are dominating the conversation are we now at equilibrium because we have like one side is, is this like is tech a two-party system where like okay now we got our republicans or democrats or not that those political labels map to these movements but you know just the notion of okay there are two views that roughly express how people feel about tech um, or, you know, five years from now, are we going to have that equilibrium between these two states or these two parties, or are we going to say, or is EAC going to sort of, you know, is there just going to be this resurgence of techno optimism that crowds out any other sort of like pessimism? Um, yeah. I kind of wonder what the future is going to look like. The other week when Hamant from General Catalyst put up his responsible AI sort of, you know, uh, movement 
And there was so much criticism from other venture capitalists about it. That, that was one of the first times I saw kind of like a open, explicit, like internal VC cleavage. Uh, it, it's kind of rare to see. And to me, that's kind of evidence of what you're, you're talking about, whereas there are these real camps. Um, and, and that would, was on sort of the AI issue. But then also, I, I, th I think another kind of interesting moment is that like All In had Tucker Carlson on their podcast th this past week. Really? That, that really? yeah. Yeah. Tucker, the other day, Tucker Carlson just went on the podcast. And that to me feels like a watershed or just like if, if, if you were imagine four years ago or like in the era of Trump, where we would say, hey, the biggest tech podcast in the world is going to have like the biggest Trump spokesperson on the world. And the podcast is actually gonna be pretty sympathetic to Trump. They're like, Trump did a lot of great stuff. You'd be like, oh my God, things have really changed. Um, and so it, it does feel like there's a broader civil war that's happening. And my hypothesis is that EAC is the acceptable way to, to fight it. Like it's, it's, it's still unacceptable to be like, you know, like Fox news or like Trump or something, but um, you know, but it's pretty acceptable to be, yeah, you're like, yeah, pro tech is good. Tech, tech is great. And I think if it's not happening already, I wouldn't be surprised if people try to shoehorn their like pet issue through the vehicle that is mm -hmm. EAC because it's not, it's not tainted yet um, in a way that uh, other things might, might be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's, what the future holds, I don't know. I think that it's damn hard to build stuff and, uh, people need to psych themselves up to do it and what level or like of, of, of group organization that comes from that, uh, that energy comes from, whether it's your team, your, your five person startup, or, you know, your, uh, 50 person startup or your, uh, thousand person company, uh, like you have to have something. And I just think like, I don't know, it yeah, seems like, um, a place, a place, a place where this, a thing that, that, that this come that you know, especially, right. I think it's really interesting to note, right. Like people who are kind of like open source builders, people who uh, are in the early stages of building a product, right. They really resonate with it because they're like, in a way, like kind of culturally isolated. They're like maybe they have like, you know, their yeah. friends and all that stuff, but like um, to really feel the, the sense of being on a team that you need to feel right. It's, it's like really important for human psychology. And, and I don't think we should, we should underrate it or say that it's that this is part of the thing, you know, it's like, it's, yeah. um, but I think it's, one thing that's interesting fuel. is that two of the people who've been most pro tech in the last five years and willing to be warriors for it are, are Mike Solana and, and Balaji. And I, I would call them like EAC adjacent, but they don't have like EAC in the bio or something. And I wonder if it's because EAC is like pretty focused on like what you just, you know, pro builder, you know, it, it takes a political issue in the context of AI, but it doesn't really weigh into other things, whereas like Solana and Balaji do. So it's, e it's easier for someone like Gary Tan or Mark Andreessen to put EAC in their back because they don't have all these people. They're not taking like positions on hotter topics that could be more alienating, whereas Solana and Balaji do. That, that, um, and that's why they're like EAC adjacent, but not like representative of EAC in, in, the, in the same way or all in on EAC even though they've been the biggest probably pro tech fighters in the last like five years. I think it's important to point out that like, there's a difference between EAC and like a person. Right. And, and, and like, I don't know, Beth and I have been pretty loose. Like we don't really, yeah. Like we kind of came up with a thing, but um, we're not like trying to impose some sort of structure. Like we're not writing. I mean, there's, there's a couple of essays that say, Oh yeah, this and that, but like it, in practice, I think, there's a, a lot of degrees of freedom here and people, many people who have been around in the community for the whole time exercise those degrees of freedom. And it's, there's not like so much homogeneity. And I think, you know, in this sense, you can, I mean, you know, this notion of like for, forking, right. It's like, yeah, like, great. Like it's, it's, it's just, yeah, it's just, it's just cultural evolution. And, and yeah, there's like some, some uh, linguistic rails around it, but like, um, I, I don't think that anybody wants this to be a, a, a thing uh, that is like so rigorous and, and, and it's not easy to define a large group of people in there who think for themselves uh, in the same way that you can define like what a single person like Mike or, or whomever might think. And um, I think this is good. I, I, I think that the kind of thing where you have like 
uh, like mode collapse, like where like everybody is on one thing. Uh, everybody believes the same thing about everything is really weird and degenerate behavior uh, in the mathematical sense of degenerate. And um, <laughs> uh, I think this is like this creates fragility in your in in your culture. This creates fragility in the the um, institutions that you uh, create and and so on. And this is like what we see with EA. They nominally claim to be able to update their positions and be rigorous about things. And, oh, if you just prove, you know, give me some evidence that I'm, you know, totally wrong. Like, okay, well, if, if the linguistic complexity of buying into the doom memes, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, some, some uh, you know, very small number of steps, right? Uh, and, and then the, the complexity that it requires to get certain people out is like exponential, right? Uh, some massive, uh, rapidly growing function. Uh, you may just find that the culture gets stuck there. It's like, it's just a black hole in this sense. It's like, you can't get out. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I've tried to argue with people, I've tried to make points, but they're just, they just are stuck in like a pattern that Yudkowsky laid out, uh, Bostrom has laid out, I mean, uh, 10, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, and, and, and uh, yeah, I think this is fragile and, and, and bad uh, need more variants i think that making a leaderless movement requires very deliberate actions to not be perceived as the leader um it's this tricky balance because you see it all the time in like open source projects and like this was i think the failure of a lot of DAOs. it's there's that there's two failure modes there's one where a leader creates a movement and then they sort of say oh i want to be super hands-off on it and then but it's at the stage where the project or the community or the movement or whatever still really needs a leader to guide it. And then if that leader is super hands off, then people are just sort of confused and run around with their heads cut off and then it, it dies um, because there wasn't enough leadership. And then there's the other side where, um, where, yeah, you, you have um, leaders who are desperately trying to shake off their power, but it's actually pretty tough when people just they want to glom onto a person. Um, I think Vitalik has probably done a really good job of this, given how much power Ethereum has and how much power he could have, you know, captured for himself. But he tried really, really hard to sort of, you know, he doesn't want to be the center of Ethereum. Um, and so, and I think at this stage, he's cultivated a bunch of other, you know, figures and organizations and stuff that can help, yeah, disperse that power to other places. Um, but yeah, I think like when I think about it, yeah, it is the fact already now that there are all these, you know, uh, press pieces or exposés or whatever that are really putting it in terms of like who is Beth Jesus or whatever, you know, it, it feels like they've already glommed onto this concept of, oh, there's a leader behind this movement. And I think it will take a lot of deliberate action to, if, if you really don't want to be at the center of it to kind of like pass that off to someone else I, I uh i mean i generally yeah i take your point uh i why do journalists like pattern match to certain things certain ways uh you know who knows why do they want to dox people who knows uh they just need clicks they need attention and uh, that's that's fine uh i do think there's like social wiring in people that's just kind of there uh, by default that you know uh, there, there's like social dynamics that, that, that we tend to, to follow and like having a leader in a group is one of them. Uh, having leaders is, is just a, a feature of being human. Um, but yeah, yeah, there's, I think, I think a pretty decent balance has been struck in practice. I don't know. Yeah. I, I want to return to something you, you wrote in the piece where you said sure. that, um, both EAC folks and sort of, uh, doomers or journalists or whatever, anti-tech folks, you know, people have critiqued the 2010s, but for different reasons. And, and, and maybe the, I don't know if this is a wrong summarization, but maybe one side critiques it because they thought it was actively bad for the, for the world. You know, social media was causing Trump, et cetera, all, all these bad, bad things. And another side or, or the act folks critiqued it because it wasn't definite enough or it wasn't ambitious enough, or it was a little bit too m money grubby. Is that an accurate summary? Uh, yeah, I think probably Nadia and I have slightly different opinions about this, but like, yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. And so, and what I wonder is, because one version of the, of the world is, hey, 
you know, we need to own up for the mistakes of 2010. But I, I think the Mike Solano view of the world is actually like, we, we were right. <laughs> actually, it was a psyop. And like, Facebook did connect the world. And Twitter, like even Teal was wrong, like 140 characters actually means a lot. Um, and there were like, you couldn't even describe the world before Uber. Like, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible, right? Like, and, and things did make a big difference. And we just didn't have the sort of moral um, or intellectual sort of just or even uh, aesthetic or vibes kind of justification or um, to defend ourselves. We didn't have the ammo, but we were actually like on the right side of history and, and maybe not going far enough because we didn't have that courage or we didn't have AI or we didn't have the right technology or we didn't have the, the right whatever, like the, the opportunity wasn't there. But that's that's a very different valence from, hey, the, the journalists were right, but for the wrong reasons, um, as opposed to, no, actually they were wrong, and we need to like tri triple down, on, like we were treated. Poor. You, you got to get the sort of what, what I'm saying here. Yeah, I mean, we might have slightly different views on this. I think the, I think that whole sort of Web 2.0 era of bringing the offline world online was a necessary piece of text trajectory and the world's trajectory. Like, yeah, I, I do think social technologies and social platforms were important and necessary to bring online somehow. So like the fundamental fact of their existence is not bad. Um, and I think I just, yeah, there was a lot of noise beyond those sort of maybe like core innovations that I think people in Tech maybe got like a little bit too high on their own supply on. Um, and I think there was, with any sort of major technological paradigm shift or innovation or whatever, there are multiple sides to it. I think this is the thing that I, I, I still have really mixed feelings on and I don't know how to, I don't have a really clear view on this yet, but you know, on the one hand, everyone in tech is really adamant about how we did, you know, we did nothing wrong. And this time was, you know, it, it was, it's good that we created all this stuff to connect people. And like, that's true. That it's good that we create all this stuff to connect people. But at the same time, you kind of zoom into like people's micro behaviors, right? Like I turn off all notifications on my phone, um, except for like text messages, right? The average person that is like not in tech is getting constantly pinged by like, these crazy notifications. I can't even imagine living that way, right? But I think like a lot of my peers in tech understand, oh, that's not good because you want to, you know, stay focused or whatever. Um, we conceptually understand that it is bad to spend all day scrolling on your phone and just like obsessively reading feeds. Like we know that's bad for your brain. And I don't think that's controversial at all anywhere, especially like within, it's just like, you know, that's not good for you. So there's some disconnect for me still between I can't take this super hardline stance that oh everything was so perfect about you know everything that was created in the 2010s. It, it feels like there's still some undiscussed part of it, and I think the reason people have been so black and white about this is because if you want if you were to concede publicly at all that there were there's any, it's anything but perfect, the opposition camp right now or whatever you want to call it is extremely politicized and extremely anti-tech and they sort of put all the blame on, you know, these big tech companies or whatever. And then it's like, well, I don't want to affiliate with that. Like I, I don't share that kind of view. And I think that's the tension that I was trying to get to that you're talking about of, um, you know, you might agree that there were some things wrong about that decade, but for different reasons, like I don't see that as a, a fundamental indictment of tech or the core value proposition of tech. I don't think tech is bad in any shape or form. Um, and I think, but I think that has been the takeaway in the like, public discourse is just sort of like, because there were some issues with these technologies, therefore all of tech is bad to be maybe a little reductive about it. And the fact that there isn't um, some other view that is maybe like a little bit more nuanced or can express like what I, yeah, where I'm coming from, I think then just sort of makes me feel like I don't want to talk about it at all, or I don't know how to talk about it yet. I certainly have thoughts about this. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't. Yeah, I don't know that there. I think that um, you can create great things and then like notice that there are 
um, things that are consequences of what you've done that, that, you know, what you've created that uh, are not like ideal uh, for you. And, and, and then you go and, and correct those. Like, uh, I don't know, this is the whole history of technology. I think I made this argument to you, Dadia, right? It's like, you can kind of like do like backwards induction, right? Like sort of from, you know, if you think that like the, the creation of uh, errors or like residuals in the sense, right? If, uh, uh, you know, uh, like a regression model. Uh, if you think the creating these, like, uh, in the sense of, uh, making technology is bad, uh, and that we should never do create technology that creates some, uh, you know, externality or whatever, uh, that, that, you know, ma many people agree that they don't want, uh, or that we should, should not have wanted to do, uh, or to create. Um, yeah, like you can kind of go backwards through all the way to, you know, any, any invention in, in history and say, okay, well, we shouldn't have. And I think like the, the whole point of doing technology is uh, to be in this loop where you create stuff, you fix something, you know, you fix problems that are in scope, you create stuff, you create, you fix problems that are in scope and you just keep going. And do we get better at that over time? Like, yeah, we have uh, like, when we design a, a, you know, like, right. Like uh, we know how to build bridges now, right. There's, there's uh, you know, there was like a whole period where like, this was like an art, right. Like where it was like, okay, we kind of understand some of the, the physics intuitively, maybe there's a little bit of math that we use, right? And and then over time, it's like, it's such a rigorous science. It's like, you talk to people who are like civil engineers that build bridges and you're like, this is the most boring thing in the world because they just, I mean, it's like important work, but like they, they're just, it's, 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 it's nailed down, right? It's, it's, it's uh, uh, very algorithmic. And so um, I think like, People make the argument that okay, like oh yeah, well with with AI, right? We can be really specific because I think people will be thinking about this when, when they hear me say this. With AI, it's quite dangerous to uh, to to take this kind of risk. You know, you can't. You know, we created cars and they were really like smelly and created a lot of pollution. And then over time, we fixed the pollution. And you know, you'll have uh, people trying to bring in this nuance of like, okay, well we needed regulation to reduce the pollution. Blah, blah. It's all true. I agree. Um, I think like. The case of AI is very different uh, from 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 these things, and in all sorts of ways, it's really really tough to analogize AI to anything else. And I think a lot of people have tried, and I, I see I see them uh, all as mostly having failed uh, in in most ways. Um, but the idea that like we can't build AI technology uh, without uh, you know kind of instantly dooming ourselves, right? The idea that we like don't have time to fix problems. It's actually already been proven wrong. We already have a superhuman AI called GPT-4, which has been deployed in the world with many, many errors and bugs and, and things that it's prone to that are not uh, uh, ideal outputs or ideal behaviors of the system uh, that have been like patched and fixed over time. This is the process of doing engineering, right? This is like what you do. And um, the idea that it's like this kind of like uh, this, this, you know, once you cross this certain threshold, it's just like the whole world is over. The light cone has been consumed by ASI. I don't think that this is true. And um, I think even if you construct a world that that where that is true, I don't think we're at all uh, headed towards a world like that. And um, I don't think that like, <laughs> yeah, I think most serious people know this. I think this is 100% a hangover from the way that Yudkowsky talks about it, uh, which is that, you know, past some certain point of capabilities, uh, you know, like the whole, the whole game is, is lost. And, and so this is what people are concerned about with, with AI and, um, yeah, no, we can dig into the specifics here if you want. I don't, I don't want to go like too, too far on a tangent, but. I want to return to something we spoke about in the beginning, which is, um, sort of the meme versus philosophy. Cause I remember Nadi, we were getting into sort of debates early on where I was saying something like, like, Hey, yeah, isn't just. Is it, it's not only a vibe, it actually has a substantive, like specific philosophy to it, which they just haven't expressed yet, but it, it's like as specific and as substantive as effective altruisms, which has just put more effort and had more time. And, and that didn't resonate with you as much partially. Be, I, th I, th I think because you're like, no, it should be its own thing as opposed to trying to be this the sort of, you know, mirror image or something. And to which I s then want to ask like, my sense is you, you, you Nadia, you probably wouldn't think that Mark Andreessen's manifesto is like the, either A, a philosophy itself, or B, like the EAC philosophy. Um, so um, are my assumptions right? And if so, why is that? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I don't know that I've had 
I don't, I don't know if I've um, critically thought about the precise definition of what a philosophy is, but when I think about like philosophies are sort of like, you know, like software frameworks or something that or it's just, I mean, just it's, it's like a framework. Right. And, and a clearly articulated philosophy gives you this lens on which to like build other things on top of it. Right. Um, whereas I think of, something like yeah, maybe as a more, I don't know, maybe like a more lateral foundation or something where it's not really telling you very much about how to build. It is telling you to do a certain thing. Um, it's more of like a signal than it is. Yeah. Philosophy to me is something that you can remix and like build on top of. But then again, like I think calling it a meme is just too reductive because Memes travel very fast through space and time, but they carry very granular bits of information. Um, and then they, you know, kind of propagate and then they die um, like a virus kind of thing. Um, and that doesn't feel like what's happening with EAC either. And so, yeah, I don't know what that category of thing is, uh, but it, ni neither of those versions seem like correct to me. Baze, you alluded in the beginning, you, you said there is more, like, when people dig in, they're like, no, no, what is actual the substance behind EAC? If you had to put the shortest definition to it, is it sort of this co-evolution concept? Um, or this sort of like, I don't know if it's like evolutionary concept. And, and so that it's just like a, a theory of how innovation happens or how, how change happens in a way that we should um, in, in embrace it. Uh, as opposed to be scared of it because that that will uh, lead to even worse. You know, the tweet that was going viral the other day of like why safe AI is more dangerous than unsafe AI. I actually didn't see that. I didn't see that 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 that, that post at all. Uh, yeah, maybe you can send it to me. Um, this might be a little bit like this sort of thing. Like you kind of know it when you see it. Uh, I, I I can tell you the kinds of like heuristics that I think about the space of problems with and the, the, the ones that, you know, uh, Beth uses and, 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 and other people, uh, in the community use. And I think like what we would notice is that they're all like really similar and we can try to write those down. I can try to like say them right now, but I think it's just a lossy process and it's just much better when you kind of like decompress the thing on a particular input. And I don't know, that it's like worthwhile to, to, to try to do this, uh, here, I think I would probably just not do very well at it. And I, I don't know. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, obviously right over the last, you know, 18 months or whatever, we've asked ourselves the question of like, okay, well, should we write, write this down? Should we write that down? And it's like, uh, well, one, it's just a pain to write things because especially when you have like a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, eyes on it because it's just it creates surface area for people to try to like find logical flaws and and it's just like why do you want to be a contract lawyer right it's like we, we're we're trying to build technology we're trying to live our lives uh not play the contract lawyer game where you like you know cover every loophole and every little objection people might have i think it's just like really tedious and i don't know like if i look at like the history of uh you know formal philosophy right um I see a bunch of people arguing with each other because language is really, really, really noisy and messy. And uh, I, I see very little like convergence about things. And I don't, I don't see that it's really been that productive. And I'm like, I almost don't want to play that game. I'm pretty fine. It, like what I would say is like, if you ask people in the community, like if you give them a bunch of pairs of things, you say, is this, is this EAC or more EAC or is this, they'll be able to answer every time. And there would be like, wildly like high coherence in the answers. Uh, and if you say like, you know, um, is this EAC or not, you know, it's similar, right? Like if you go and read philosophers, like most of them are idiots. Like they just say random shit and they like justify it with some like line of shitty reasoning. And it's like, it's fine. It's fine. Like everybody is kind of like that. Um, everybody like picks like a narrow cone to like argue down and, 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 and the world is really complicated. So, uh, this is, this is kind of a necessity, right? But, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, unnecessary demands for rigor will be uh, rebuffed. I, th I think what I do hear when, you know, people are sort of chafing for 
for yeah i write something down or you know what what is the actual philosophy it's to me it's a sign that people are are engaged on a superficial level or you know you've got their attention and now they want the next thing right um so it's it's a positive signal in the sense that okay people are paying attention they're like what is this thing tell me more they're hungry for something more and so they liken it to a philosophy because that's kind of what they've been told or that's you know what people are saying EAC is uh but I don't think that's actually what they want they want they want the next step and I think for mm. EAC it's actually much less important to sit and like write things down and it's more important to go do things right um like I think it'd be really cool like, if we're just thinking about sort of what is phase two of EAC look like or whatever um, yeah, I don't see it being like about publishing books about um, like the epistemic foundations of EAC or something like that. Um, I think this, the phase two version I actually, of- can I, can I interject there? Oh, yeah. Just on that particular point, if somebody wants to try to do that, like I encourage them to try to do it, whether it will be successful is another question. Um, but yeah, go, go, go on. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I like writing books, so, um, <laughs> not anti exactly. anti yeah. at all. But I think like for the the ethos or the, because EAC is all about, you know, if, if it is supposed to be this cultural signal for definite optimism or a cultural signal for builders, then I think the most important thing then is like showing, you know, maybe not a centralized agenda, but just like like initiatives that are then, you know, coming out of EACs, finding each other and getting excited and, and, and like building stuff together. Right. Because um, I mean, people often talk about like Gary or Mark being, you know, some of the um, louder advocates or proponents of this thinking, but they've been doing stuff even pre yak I think it'd be really cool to have a generation of people that are, you know, in the way that, you know, effective altruism has, has its positives and negatives, but in the early days, especially, like they had a bunch of like specific initiatives that came out of it because people were finding each other over this philosophy and then like trying to do things together. And you had funders coming in and supporting them. And if EAC is becoming this sort of watering hole or shelling point for people that share these values and philosophies and you have people that want to support those initiatives like i think that would be a really cool phase two and that matters i think more than trying to sit around trying to define what exactly the philosophy is yeah yeah no i completely agree right the 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 uh, actions matter more than words thing applies here <laughs> like a lot um i hear like this is this is the thing right like um people have given yadkowski like I don't know, $100 million or something over the last 20 years. I, I actually don't know the number. I think at some point on, on Bankless, he said he was sitting on 50 million and didn't know what to do with it. Um, that doesn't surprise me that he doesn't know what to do with it. I think given like 20 or 30 years of trying to you know, solve this problem in, in, in a particular way, right? solve the, the AI risk problem as he sees it, uh, they didn't converge. They just like made a cult, did some math, told everybody that it was an info hazard to publish any of their math, uh, after, you know, whichever year it was, like 2012 or 13, when they stopped publishing stuff out of Miri and, and then just never really converge. And all they did was like, uh, just black pill everybody else in the space. Um, even, even the people who had taken to heart all the arguments and had, uh, actually, you know, continued to basically believe them, like people like, uh, you know, Paul Cristiano or like Chris Ola, um, uh, or, or Dario. I was so frustrated with, so, so for people who don't know, right, there was a post, I mean, you can go look it up. Like, uh, it, you know, the, the meme was like, uh, Miri announces their die with dignity strategy. Yudkowsky's like, you know, last ditch hope for humanity of like solving the, the ultimate mathematical formulation of the alignment problem, you know, with a perfect theorem or whatever, you know, he, he, they, you know, the, the meme was that they'd given up and the only hope was that we could just die with dignity. And that was the best. And, and, you know, in that, he lists out people by name, people like Chris and Paul, like they, that their efforts had failed. They were too slow, blah, 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 blah. And you know what? I just felt like this is like an absolutely horrible, mean and shitty thing to do because like, I don't know. I'll just be like really, really blunt about this. Like the whole like rationality sphere in Berkeley is like, has a lot of cult dynamics, not just like loosely, you know, like explicitly, like there's like one guy who wrote a book that everybody like follows and reads and takes really seriously. Not only that, but they have like an, a course belief about the world ending that they're all aligned around that. They're all like oriented towards like fixing and the, the destruction of, of, of people's psychology, uh, psychologies that came out of that, the destruction of like 
the potential of all of these like incredibly smart people that got like lured into this trap and, and other like really real human harms. All of the, the, the nasty things that came out of this, I, I don't think they're an accident. I think Yudkowsky has an ex extremely powerful ability to persuade people. When I saw the, the, the Iowa's Dignity post and I saw him, him just absolutely savagely like dunking on these people that he had pulled in and then like just kind of thrown them into the trash because he's like too, too depressed, too black pilled on the whole thing to just like give them the space to actually try to, to do something good for the world. I realized that there was just something fundamentally wrong here and that we had to, we had to kind of fix it. And um, I actually believe that we have, I, I think that he looks like a huge idiot now. It was our, it already looked stupid, but I think it looks really, really bad in light of the optimism that people want to have. And, you know, like I've, I said this very early on and I continue to say it every time it comes up, the work that Anthropic's doing on, on, on interpretability, people at OpenAI, anybody who's seriously working on like deep learning reliability, like I commend them. I think this is like good engineering. We should do good engineering. Let's go and fix it. Let's go and do it. And I think when I saw this, this like thing where some people who were incredibly smart, incredibly gifted, uh, like Chris and Paul, uh, getting just dunked on in this way, I, I, I realized that those two groups were actually not on the same team. In my opinion, it's very likely they don't even really take uh, Yudkowsky seriously, but I think it's important to, to notice like where the whole culture came from where all of these arguments about doom and like, uh, like these very simplistic frameworks about how deep learning systems are going to work in the future uh, and AI systems are gonna work in the future, where they all come from, which is the same, the same man, the same cult. I think that we can, we can move beyond it and, and we can grow beyond it. And there, you know, there are people that work on alignment, that work on uh, rel like reliability and this sort of stuff that I would call like my good friends. So, and you know, we, we, we argue about like uh, the regulation stuff. It's like, this is where there's real debate to be had. I think when people are seeking um, sort of uh, the philosophy or the substance of it, I think they, they're excited. There's a, just a set of people who a vibe is not enough or, or like they just need something to make sense because they want to buy it and they want to seem serious. And I, I think when, when, when there is something written down, it's harder to defend um, or it's harder to, for a certain type of person. Maybe maybe a person who's persuaded by EA style arguments, right? Um, they want things to make sense, they, and they want things to legibly make sense. I also think the benefit of not writing so that, that I think that's a con for a certain type of person. I think the con, the, the pro for for not writing things down is it's much harder to attack. Um, you know, when when things are written down, it's very clear, and um, e either there are people who've written them down or there are specific arguments. You know, everything can be deconstructed in in some sense. And when there's nothing to deconstruct, it's it's harder to attack, but it also could be harder to defend. Um, and right now, um, you know, yeah, is on the on the up and up. But if their movements get hot and then they get not hot, right? <laughs> they they um, and so they get played out. And so sure, the only thing I care about is that uh, people stay optimistic and and stay determined to build cool things and 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 build a good future. I don't care about whether EAC is like a name that persists. I don't think anybody really cares. I think like we just kind of found each other on, on the internet as a group and we're gonna, you know, continue to build up uh, whatever momentum there is to build up. I, I, I think a lot of the, the arguments around it is just, it's fine and silly. There's like some sport to it, that's fine. But at some point, uh, things things uh, exhaust their usefulness. I, maybe it's uh, one month from now or 10 years from now or 20 years from now. I don't know. I have no idea. Okay, but that feels really defeatist to me. I don't know. I'm just... <laughs> is it? I'm just going to call is it, it out. No, I, 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 I think I'm just... My ego is not plugged into this, like, to just be really frank about yeah, it. Like, is, it's not like that. I just... Up. Like the whole, you know, this tension between being a leader of a movement that you want to be leaderless or something. I think these are all the same things that like everyone in this position grapples with, right? Where it's maybe you should not be writing it down because if your intention is to sort of disperse the power to other people or whatever. Um, so like I get why you personally maybe don't have, I believe, I mean, I, from all the conversations we have, like, I don't think you have any ego around this at all. Um, and uh, but that's different from sort of what does this mean to other people and what do they need from it? And so, you know, maybe it's not you or Beth writing, but it's like someone should. I think people just want to take action right? or they want to be part of it. And this is the moment where yeah. 
yeah, you've like brought all these people into a community. Now everyone is standing in a room, looking around, like excited, talking, and they're like, who's in charge? What am I supposed to be doing? No, and I disagree with that. From that Everybody's sad. standing in a room. I disagree with that. I, I, I agree with all the part, the, the part, all the parts up to that, but we're standing in the room and we're like, the future is going to be fucking awesome. Here's how I'm building it. Here's how I'm building it. Here's how I'm building it. And that's what it is. Uh, people are aligned around like what they're actually doing. They, and, and then, yeah, the support of the, the community, the culture is like, good, good. Do you, what, what do you need? Like, how can I help you? Do you need, uh, you know, we have a bunch of people who are aligned, who believe in like working really hard, who believe in, in crazy, like grand visions of the future still, uh, who believe in like just the power of like the human spirit to, to actually, uh, you know, kind of prevail and, and, and build technology that, that works and works well. We're all there doing this. I don't know that people are really looking. I, I don't know. Maybe I have like a biased view because uh, I'm just surrounded by like the, the, the closest several hundred people to me in this, in this, in this graph are like all very uh, like they have agency and they're like, really competent people. And it's just, it's just an incredible group, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of meetups. And I think, and I think uh, people are constantly talking online, talking, talking in spaces. Like we've had thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of spaces where it's like, how to approach this problem, how to, how to think about this thing here. Oh, you're struggling with how, what to do next. Here's, here's, here's the community support in that way. It's like all of those, those features are, are, are there. And so, the leadership that emerges is is kind of this de facto sort of thing in every given context, and whoever's there is 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 going to to take that role. I think kind of this is along the lines of what you're saying is like, insofar as it's needed in a certain situation, does it emerge? My observation is that it kind of does. Maybe a part of the reason that I found like our uh, first conversation uh, so productive is because you were coming from the outside a little bit and, and asking questions that nobody had asked me before. And I think that they're useful questions. And I think um, answering them is probably useful. And some of those look like kind of more formalization and that's probably fine, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad it's happening and I want more of it, I guess. I'm, I'm curious for your guys' perspective on Mark's manifesto where he, um, you know, wrote down a very explicit argument for why and how tech is, is good um, and capitalism is good and um, referenced a whole sort of thinkers. Some people were upset that he maybe referenced them in a bastardized way or the opposite of what, what they meant, but he sort of, you know, connected an argument together. And then he also said, here are the enemies of that. <laughs> um, here are the people who are trying to stop that. Here's how they are trying to stop that. Here's the arguments they, they use. Here's why those arguments aren't good. Um, here's why they lead to bad outcomes. Here are examples of, of outcomes that have been disastrous, like nuclear and, and others. Um, and I feel like that was received like mixed re reviews. I, I think some people loved it, but most people were kind of like indifferent to it. And some people were certainly turned off um, by it. Um, I'm curious your reactions to my characterization and why is and, and your reactions to the piece and why isn't it that just like the default EAC manifesto? Yeah, I mean, I read it. I was like, "This is this is yak as fuck," right? Like, I don't know. Uh, uh, there's no doubt about it uh, to me. Uh, we can talk about the specific claims and the specific arguments, and certainly, there's there's always more nuance we can layer and 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 more analysis we can put. I don't know. Yeah, you talk about why nuclear like didn't happen the way that it could have happened. I mean, this is a, an overdetermined question, right? It's like there's a lot of causes for why things don't occur. To me, like, I think this is the ultimate, like, goal of the of the piece is to sort of say something about this, uh, which is like, as we move into this era where we're kind of unblock these limits on the amount of intelligence, the amount of energy, the amount of work we can do in the physical world that historically have been bounded basically by the human reproductive rate and like the carrying capacity of civilization. As we, we unblock them, right? Energy is a little bit different, but uh, you know, in the case of uh, intelligence, like it's always been bounded by by the number of brains there are in the world, and it's just not. It's actually already no longer true, and 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 we're already seeing the you know the effect of this, and and it's like just been a few months. The the question that I I guess I want to try to answer a little bit is like, what is this 
the spirit that we need to embody to 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 move into this world, the new world uh, that we're building. And I don't know. To me, like I think EAC is 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 an answer to it. Um, and I don't I don't I don't think it's like the total answer. I think that um, in in cases of making policy or making uh, determinations about how to run your company or you know whatever it might be, uh, what to build next, like. There are a lot of uh, more specific questions that you have to ask, but like as a cultural kind of hyper parameter, I think it's really a, a solid start. Yeah, the whole culture around culture around this, the the way that capitalism for, formed around this and grew around this, uh, all these these natural constraints of 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 our capabilities, yeah, just produced a certain way of of relating to technology and relating to building it, and 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 I, I almost feel like it culminated with. Uh, or has culminated with the, the kind of like, uh, from my perspective, like the big, the big tech era of, of like people being like, yeah, this is like, uh, you know, as good as it gets, you get a job, you know, you make 500 K a year, just like working two hours a week at Google. And like, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's great. And, and in some sense, I think that there's like something about that age that is, 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 has not the end of that has begun. The next one looks a lot different because our, the, you know, the, uh, the single press of a button has carries so much power, right? It, has, it can have such an impact on the world. You can do uh, so much, right? When you have like intelligence, it's like scaffolded and, and, and directed. And, uh, you know, um, when we, when we move to having uh, like large scale robotics and, and more automated manufacturing and, and all of these things, what it means to be a human actually just fundamentally changes because we, we, I mean, right now we don't have the, that kind of power, but in that world, it's like from, you know, it, it's, it's, the further back in time you go, the more true this is. But even today, right? Like if, if I told you today that I had like the, the power of like a 50,000 person, you know, company of like the smartest people on earth, right? All aimed at like whichever goal I pointed them at, right? Or a hundred thousand people. Like if I told you I had that power today, it was just like my keyboard. Like that would seem like uh, god godlike that would seem divine and i think this is the thing that characterizes what we're uh, moving into now and i think people are right to be kind of unsettled by this right uh, gods are powerful um uh they're yeah like we don't we don't know what that world will look like um but i think i think yeah you know you see a lot of people using this language uh, you know in the act people you know the, the the thermodynamic god meme, right? The there's the the like I think Rune and 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 many others like have talked about these these sort of things as the machine gods or we become gods, we become like gods, we demigods, whatever it is. You know, I think all of it is just um, it, like why does their language get religious? I think it gets religious because we are moving when you move into um, a regime where the way that you interpret it uh, into a world where the way that you like interpret it, the way that you understand it um, is necessarily like lowered in resolution in some ways. Um, it's, it's actually a better like framework for, for thinking about it. Right. It's kind of like uh, pre pre modern people, right. Or something, right. They didn't uh, have like concrete understandings, like the causal mechanisms of things. Right. And so they kind of ascribe these like personalities and so on. I think there's a there's a there's a loose analogy there with, with this, which is like people right right now understand, you know, in, in some sense, I think, you know, there's this whole kind of like part of Twitter, right? You know, people call it teapot or whatever, like where over time, uh, like over the last few years, like people have. Yeah, where there's like a lot of group coherence. And, and I think, you know, there were, you know, various stages of it were, were about different things, but I think you know, uh, towards the end of last year, I kind of realized that what was going on in this, this, you know, some smaller corner of it was just like about processing this fact of humanity building uh, AGI or you know, building powerful AI systems and like what that means, you know, like, uh, I think the, the, the actual tweet was like, uh, you know, we're here, we're all here kind of collectively processing, um, you know, the fact that humanity is pregnant with AGI, right? And we kind of know this, we kind of know that it's, 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 um, it's imminent and that it will be transformative. I think everybody's just groping around trying to understand what it will mean. Um, but 
it's a very different thing from like, I'm going to take a hammer and like uh, s- hammer in a spike to put down these like railroad uh, ties. And <laughs> you know, it's like, whatever, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Like uh, th- this kind of very well-defined um, simple systems Uh when we bring like the speed of the internet to the rest of the world, uh, when we bring the velocity of all of that to the, to the rest of the world, uh, things will look very different. But I don't think that because it's different, it means it's necessarily doomed. I think we have to work to try to build a world we want to live in. And the good news is that everybody wants to build a world they want to live in, uh, by and large. And another good piece of news is that, um, in the world where you want to do things, uh, capital, capital, uh, does like fundamentally capital translates into work on the universe computer. Right. Um, and so people who are scared about, uh, you know, things like suddenly Fumi taking over or whatever, I think like I'm, I'm far less pessimistic about these things in part because most capital is like self-preserving and, and, and humans are in charge of capital and probably will continue to be in charge of capital for uh, a long time, uh, very long time. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this is just like one, one, one line of argument we could go down, but, um, yeah, I think what this means is that we, we will get a world where the will of humanity is like done in work, uh, uh, through, through capital, through, through AI. And, uh, yeah, there, there are stable equilibria here. I think people who, who, who think about new power coming into the world get scared because they're like, if I played Carlson at chess right now, I would lose and I can't defeat an ASI, a, a super, a super intelligence at, you know, chess, much less, you know, uh, guiding the future of the resources on earth. And I just think that, um, this is a reasonable position, but I don't think it's the position we were going, we were going to be in and it never was. And so, uh, I'll stop there. Is there anything that we haven't yet covered either from the piece or that's just top of mind that we think would be particularly interesting to um, sort of end with or, uh, or or get into as a last last topic. I am open minded about this. Nadia, did you did you have any thoughts? I don't have anything top of mind? Um, I'm okay to stop there. Yeah, maybe maybe just as a closing question. Nadia, you hinted at like a phase two, and you know you wrote the canonical piece on on idea machines, and so. Um, I'm not sure if we've flesh, fleshed out that thought, but to the extent that EAC has has phases or upcoming phases, and you've seen these sort of um, communities or movements have different cycles to them, what do you uh, either expect or predict or 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 think should be should should be developed? Or wish or hope for? Yes, my wishes and my hopes for EAC in phase two. Um, yeah, I think it is that moving towards a more more like offline action. Um, and yeah, I mean, Bayes is probably much more, is definitely much more privy to a lot of that that is happening that maybe I don't see as much, but um, yeah, like having more of this legible community or place that people can get sort of plugged in and um, have these jumping off points to collaborate with other people that are in it. Um, yeah, I think this fa- phase one was sort of getting people talking about it at all. And maybe phase two is now that people are gathered, giving them the tools, the resources, the, you know, connections they need to each other to do stuff. That would be, that would be my Christmas wish for EAC. I, uh, yeah, I totally appreciate that and agree. And uh, I will say, you know, yeah, we, we need all the help we can get because there's a lot of work to do. Um, I'm still working my way through like my backlog of DMS, uh, the number of people who like want to, to, to help who are supportive is actually mind blowing. Uh, and it just, yeah, I mean, it just takes, uh, it's, it's, it's a, yeah. Um, there's, there's so much work to do. And, uh, I think, yeah, organizing, uh, politically is something that we were absolutely, uh, we have started, uh, there are many manifestations of that. I think already you see that, you know, uh, open source has had some success in defending itself. So that's good. You know, it's like there, there are other parts of the world that, um, you know, uh, and, and the culture that, that are aligned with us. And, you know, as it turns out, right, being, being, uh, sort of fairly ideologically aligned with capital itself is kind of handy because capital does, as you know, uh, tend to, as I said, um, you know, defend itself and, and try to keep itself going. Right. So it's like, 
you know, in principle, you kind of expect NVIDIA will, uh, you know, ensure that it will continue to be able to produce chips and will still, you know, <laughs> like all of this sort of thing. So um, that's, that's, that's a useful hand here. But um, yeah, it's not just the, the political. I think people are working on, uh, you know, there's like projects to do like uh, to have like hacker houses and uh, there's projects for, um, you know, grants and, uh, you know, uh, compute collectives. And um, there's, you know, there's a lot of support of just bolstering good projects, like servicing good projects, bringing, connecting people. A lot of this stuff happens behind the scenes. Hey, you're working on this project. You should talk to this person who thought of, uh, you know, similar idea that like, you know, they used to, you know, write code at like, you know, some, you know, thing, they, you know, some great company, they, you know, they're looking for their next thing, you know, just, just th this kind of informal connectivity increases the, um, the rate at which new things get built a lot. And, uh, I don't know, it's actually impossible for me to keep up with now how much this is happening. Um, but, but certainly, yeah, like, uh, and, and, and of course, you know, I think VCs like this cause it's, I mean, this is deal flow, right? This is, this is the essence, you know, you, how do you find talented people that want to work on things that are really, really ambitious? Well, uh, it turns out if you bring a bunch of ambitious, ambitious people who build stuff together, like it's, it's a perfect reservoir, reservoir for that. And, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Some people are cynical about this. They think it's like something that's, uh, you know, cringe or bad or kind of somehow like manufactured. No, this is the essence of the whole, the whole project. And, uh, I think it's good. And, and I, I see it, uh, only in a good light. That's a good note to, to, to wrap on. Um, and Nadia, I just also want to call out and appreciate that you've decided to name your firstborn Beth Jezos in, um, in honor. <laughs> Excuse um, me. Beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah, I think, I think it's amazing for you to do that. Still we'll um, trying to decide between Days and Beth, you know, yeah, gotta exactly. get some vibes. <laughs> yeah, you'll see when it. <laughs> um, Nadia, do you want to tease out any upcoming writing or any upcoming uh, explorations or inquiries? I think so, yeah. I mean, I, I mentioned I have this a uh, longer sort of maybe like historical take on um, putting EAC into like tech culture history that'll be published in the new year. Um, so yeah. Well, thank you both for, for writing this piece and thanks for, for coming on to, to talk about it. Thanks, Eric. It was a good time. Thanks for having us.